So hi everyone, and welcome to the Ethel Brown Harvey Postdoctoral Seminar Series. My name is Daniel Medina Cano, and I'm a postdoc at uh, New York City at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And today I will be moderating together with Madison Martinez, a grad student at UT Southwestern Medical Center. And we are excited to highlight the work of our standing postdoctoral members. Today, Lauren Walker from University of Pennsylvania and Xu Feng from University of Michigan will be sharing their research. And just as a reminder, each speaker is giving 20 minutes to give their scientific talk, and that will be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. So for everybody attending, just a reminder to write your questions down in the Q&A box, and I will just read them out loud once the presentation is over. And so let's get to it. So our first speaker, Lauren Walker, did her PhD at Washington University in St. Louis at Adam D'Antonio's lab. And there she studied taxonal degeneration and how MAP kinase signaling promotes it. Then she moved for her postdoc to University of Pennsylvania to a lab of Michael Granato, where she kept on studying axonal dynamics and regeneration, in this case using zebrafish as a model. And not only that, but while doing all of that, she has also been awarded several fellowships and awards, such as NSF, F32, and K1, and has a long track record of teaching, mentoring, and even founding uh, journal club groups. So because of this, I'm truly excited about what she's going to tell us about today. So please, Lauren, Whenever you want, the stage is all yours. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, so, there we go. Um, so just like this uh, five-day-old larval zebrafish, movement is a really big part of our daily lives. And so my goal is really to understand how animals like this zebrafish, or like us, regain coordinated movement after injury. All of our coordinated movements are dependent on the correct motor neurons innervating the correct muscles. And so we'll start really simply today with a schematic of a single motor neuron. So on the top here is the cell body. This long line represents the axon, which is the job of the axon is to wire the nervous system over both short and long distances. And at the end is the synapse, which is where this neuron communicates with the next cell in the circuit, which in this case is a muscle cell. So we start with a fundamental question, which is how does this motor neuron find the correct muscle target in the context of an organism that is filled with incorrect targets? These incorrect targets include antagonistic muscles or non-muscle tissue like skin cells. And you don't just have one neuron connecting to one muscle, but we have many populations of axons that navigate through the same environment, but they have to connect to very different muscle targets. So to put all of this into perspective, take a moment to appreciate all of the complex movements that we can do with our forearms. All of these fine motor movements are dependent on different populations of axons innervating the correct muscles in your arm to enable the coordinated contraction of specific muscles at a specific time. And this complexity is shown here in this schematic of a forearm where nerves, which are bundles of axons, are shown in white. So if you consider this example trajectory of an axon, out, axon outlined in orange, its cell body is up here in the spinal cord. And after exiting the spinal cord, this axon is one of several thousand that converge at this complicated nerve network called the brachial plexus, which is a region where axons sort into target specific bundles. So if I zoom into this plexus a little more and then label the trajectories of four individual motor neurons, you can get an idea of the complexity of this region. And each of these nodes, marked here by these stars, represents uh, choice points where these different nerves come together, uh, they intermingle, and then ac axons then segregate. And axons, basically, each of these choice points have to decide which branch do I choose. And choosing correctly at each of these stepwise choice points can have major consequences as to whether the axon ever reaches its appropriate target. Because beyond the plexus, for example, our orange axon becomes part of the ulnar nerve, it navigates additional choice points, and it eventually innervates the muscle of your pinky finger. Because of their length, which can be up to a meter long, axons are vulnerable to injury and disease. And injuries to uh, the brachial plexus can be particularly debilitating because they impact function of your forelimb and they have really poor clinical outcomes. When an axon is injured, the distal or disconnected portion of it will degenerate and get cleared away. Uh, but fortunately, at least in the peripheral nervous system, axons are capable of self-repair and regeneration. So I just want to emphasize that axon regeneration, it's a specific form of regeneration where the end of this axon starts regrowing. 
So it's independent of stem cells or cell division, and it occurs locally within the axon. And in general, the axon regeneration field has been focused on how to promote regrowth of axons. But a big question in the field is once an axon starts growing, how does it actually know where to grow? Because if you want to achieve functional recovery, which means that you regain this coordinated movement, regenerating axons have to find and form synapses onto the correct target muscles. And indeed, axon targeting errors are a really big contributing factor to the scary statistic that for certain peripheral nerve injuries, less than 10% of adults fully recover their function. But how can axons renavigate multiple choice points, especially really complicated ones like the plexus, long after this circuitry was first formed in development? Despite its clinical relevance, this has been a really challenging question to address mechanistically with existing model systems, largely due to technical fe feasibility issues. And so during my postdoc, I've established a model that enables us to study the mechanisms of axon targeting from development through regeneration. The model organism that I use is the five-day-old larval zebrafish, which is the same fish that you saw moving in my first slide. And there's many reasons why they're a fantastic model organism to study basic neural biology, um, but I'll just highlight two. So first, they're optically transparent as larvae, which make them amenable to live imaging. And secondly, over 70% of human genes are well conserved within the fish, making them a really great model for basic science research that could be extrapolated to human biology. So in particular, my focus has been on the pectoral fin, which is the structure outlined here in orange. The pec fin is developmentally and evolutionarily homologous to mammalian forelimbs. And the complex but stereotyped neuroanatomy of the pec fin make it really well suited to study axon targeting. So this whole area in white here is the pectoral fin and the musculature is shown here in this colored area. The musculature is innervated by three main pools of motor neurons. The cell bodies, which are all these circles, are up here in the spinal cord. And each cell body projects an axon, which travels through a nerve within the body wall to then innervate specific domains of the fin. So this most interior nerve one in magenta innervates the top part of the fin, posterior nerve four in orange innervates the bottom part of the fin. So if we zoom into this, this region right here, this is what it looks like in a real fish where I've uh, labeled muscle fibers in orange. You can see them arranged longitudinally across the fin. Can overlay the motor axon innervation pattern in cyan, and then finally label all of the synapses uh, in magenta. But at this uh, five-day-old stage, there's an additional layer of complexity because there's actually two antagonistic muscles in the fin. So the abductor or front muscle moves the fins forward, and the adductor or uh, back muscle moves the fins backwards. And so as you'd expect, each muscle has its own independent innervation field, which you can see in this max projection where I have colored the front muscle innervation in blue and the back in orange. So the neuroanatomy of the pec fin means that motor axons have to navigate multiple choice points to find their correct muscle targets. So the, the, this uh, is a schematic of a top-down view of a larvae. The spinal cord is at the top, the head would be to the left, and this is the pectoral fin here. And um, each, uh, each motor neuron within the spinal cord will eventually innervate either the front, shown here in green, or the back muscle, shown here in orange. And all of these cell bodies in the spinal cord are mixed populations. So half of them innervate the front, half in the back. And this means that the nerves as they exit the spinal cord are also mixed populations. But they converge here at the plexus, which is similar to our, our brachial plexus, but much uh, less complex. Um, this is an area where all of these nerves converge, axons intermingle, and then they segregate into their muscle-specific bundles, which you can see here as the front innervation in green and the back innervation in orange. And then after navigating the plexus, axons then fasciculate into target-selective bundles as they innervate those specific domains. So this is a side view where spinal cord is at the top, fin is at the bottom, and this pink motor neuron from pool number one, it sorts here at the plexus, um, and it innervates the top part of the fin. And at the same time, this orange motor neuron from pool number three sorts of the plexus, it chooses the same muscle, but it goes to an entirely different domain of the fin. And so all of these choice points mean that there must be neuron intrinsic and extrinsic cues that mediate the stereotyping, stereotype targeting of these different neuronal populations. And while pec fin neuroanatomy in the fish might make look very different from our own, they actually share a lot of common features. So both have cell bodies in the spinal cord with axons that converge and sort at a plexus. 
to then segregate into target specific bundles and ultimately innervate very specific muscle targets. And so these similarities make the zebrafish pec fin a nice model for axon regeneration within forelimbs. So if we want to use this as a model to study uh, uh, regeneration, there's some essential pro uh, properties that we need to establish. And the first most basic question is, can these motor axons even regenerate at all? So I use a laser to completely transect the nerves that innervate the fin without removing or injuring the fin itself. So for all the experiments that I'm going to show you today, um, all of the axons that innervate the fin have been completely transected, but the fin is still attached to the fish. It just doesn't have any axons until they regrow. So if this is what the innervation of the fin looks like before injury, I can cut all of these nerves. And with, within seven hours, you can see that all of those disconnected distal axons have fragmented. That's all, all these um, blue and orange dots are axonal debris that will be cleared over the next 10 to 15 hours or so. And a really great strength of the fish is the ability to do long-term time-lapse imaging. So this is a transgenic animal with its motor axons labeled, um, and we're capturing the early phases of regeneration up until about 18 hours. So you first probably notice this is nerve four. It's growing in the body wall, actually behind the plane of the fin. It's gonna make a sharp turn at the bottom and then fill in this ventral region down here. And then if you focus at the top left, you can see as axons sort at the plexus, which is right here, and then start filling in the front and the back innervation. This uh, regeneration is remarkably fast. So this is a, a, a image at the end point of the movie that you just saw. Um, at about two days, you can see that these axons have regenerated to a really similar complexity and extent of growth to what they had prior to injury. So they're remarkably good at growing robustly. Um, and I don't have time to, to show you this data today, but I've also demonstrated that this regeneration is functional, which means that these axons are, are reestablishing synapses. Uh, because when axons have uh, regrown into the fin, uh, the fish is able to regain the ability to move its fin. But I'm really interested in target specificity. So are these axons just growing willy-nilly into the fin, or is there specificity uh, to their growth? So to answer that question, I took a sparse labeling approach. And I labeled single axons, like this one shown here in orange, in the context of a transgenic animal with all of its motor axons labeled, like shown in blue. And so the premise for this experiment is, if this orange axon occupied a specific muscle in a specific domain before injury, does it go back to the same place in regeneration? And for this particular axon to do so, it would have to sort appropriately at the plexus, and then actually bypass many potential choice points as it grows uh, down to the bottom of the fin till it reaches the right spot to make this posterior turn. So I cut, uh, transected all of the motor axons. I'm not showing you this, but everything completely fragmented. And really this axon could have grown anywhere in the fish, um, but it doesn't do that. So 95% of the time, these axons make the correct decision at the plexus and choose the correct muscle and 87% of the time they go back to their original domain. And they can often recapitulate a pattern that is very similar to what they had prior to injury. And so this means that, that this axon essentially knows who it is and where it belongs, and that there have to be some type of cues in the environment that tell it how to get there. So uh, the pecfin is the system where axons can regenerate within two days back to their original uh, muscle targets where they reform functional synapses, demonstrating that this process is actively regulated by unknown mechanisms. And given all the tools in the available within the larval zebrafish, um, I've turned my focus to understanding the cellular and molecular mechanisms that mediate this precise regeneration. And so I'll just tell you today uh, about how I've started um, by asking what cells are important for regeneration, because different cell types in the environment can influence axonal growth. So when thinking about cell types that might influence axon regeneration, Schwann cells are a really great candidate to start with. Schwann cells, which are shown here in orange, these are the glia and the peripheral nervous system that insulate axons to enable faster neurotransmission. And after axon injury, uh, Schwann cells de-differentiate into repair Schwann cells. They upregulate neurotrophic factors and can also form tracks upon which regrowing axons can grow. And recent work has, has uh, really shown that, that Schwann cells can upregulate guidance cues that can instruct axon guidance decisions at choice points. So I first wanted to see what Schwann cells looked like in the pectoral fin. 
Uh, so here you're looking at a maximum projection through just the front innervation pattern um, of a pectoral fin with motor axons labeled in green and Schwann cells labeled in magenta, and the Schwann cells are shown here by themselves. And you can see that Schwann cells associate with most of the axons in the pectoral fin, uh, but they're really particularly densely concentrated up here at the plexus. And as I mentioned before, the plexus is this critical region where axons coming from nerves one and three uh, converge, mingle, and then sort between the front and the back muscles. So the really close association between Schwann cells and axons in this region led me to ask if uh, these cells play a role in axon navigation through the plexus during regeneration. So first let's look at the plexus of control animals. Um, so in this experiment, I'm using transgenic animals that only label front muscle projecting axons. So prior to injury, you can see tightly fasciculated axons from nerve one and three as they converge here at the plexus, um, forming this Y shape. And then this population of labeled axons continues to form front muscle innervation. So after transecting these nerves and waiting two days for regeneration, you can see that this plexus structure is reformed. So you're already familiar from my sparse labeling experiments that 95% of axons correctly navigate the plexus to choose their correct original muscle. And so that's shown here by this really uh, bright fascicle of front muscle innervation. But this also means then that 5% that of axons get mistargeted to the back muscle, the incorrect muscle, and that's what these uh, faint axons are here. They're mistargeted axons on the wrong muscle. And this is pretty consistent. This, this X shape basically is pretty consistent um, in wild type animals. So to ask about the role of Schwann cells specifically during regeneration, I employed transgenic zebrafish that express an enzyme called nitroreductase specifically within Schwann cells. So nitroreductase catalyzes this innocuous drug called ranitazole into a cytotoxic product that causes cell death. So this allows me to specifically and temporally ablate Schwann cells. So as you can see in this uh, pre-injury image, these animals are perfectly normal before the uh, addition of the drug. So I um, <clears throat> transected axons and then um, added the drug after a couple hours to specifically ablate Schwann cells during regeneration. And the effect of ablating Schwann cells on axon navigation through the plexus is really striking. So in this example, axons fail to properly organize and sort at the plexus. Instead, they often defasciculate um, and enter the fin ectopic locations outside of the plexus. So I've quantified this uh, using a, what I'm calling a disorder uh, score at the plexus region, more of a qualitative score. So this control would have gotten a none or a mild green score, while this ablated animal would have gotten a severe score. And so I'm um, showing this quantification on the right. All of these three groups are various controls, and you can see that most of them have, <coughs> excuse me, um, very mild um, um, disorder at the plexus region. But ablating Schwann cells really drastically shifts uh, most of these animals to the severe category. So that was a time point at the end point of, of regeneration, um, but what does axon navigation look like without Schwann cells in real time? So we're zooming into this area of the pectoral fin, and in this max projection from the beginning of the movie, um, I've labeled axons in green and Schwann cells in magenta. So these big blobs, these are Schwann cell cell bodies. These are Schwann cell membranes. You won't be able to see the Schwann cells in the movie. We'll just be looking at the axons. And at the beginning of the movie, so here is the plexus, and you can see axons that are tightly fasciculated until they come to this first, these branch points, which are in the musculature. And so you can watch um, as axons uh, grow into the pectoral fin, it's pretty structured and organized. They're generally tightly fasciculated until they reach these kind of characteristic branching points. Uh, but uh, axon growth looks pretty different when I ablate these Schwann cells. So first, you'll notice in this max projection from the beginning of the movie, these big blobs, these are uh, dying uh, or dead uh, Schwann cell cell bodies. And when I start the movie, I think uh, you'll be able to, to appreciate um, how uh, disordered um, and kind of chaotic this axon growth is when axons are not present. And one major consequence for um, uh, this disorder at the plexus region is an increase of uh, axons mistargeting to the incorrect muscle. So this is a maximum projection 
um, on the left, and then a tracing of mistargeted axons on the back muscle of a control animal. So remember about 5% of axons or so get misprojected to the back muscle and those can eventually, they, they stabilize in a, in a wild type animal. Um, <clears throat> but when Schwann cells are ablated, um, there's an increase in this mistargeting, both in the total area, which is what I've quantified over here on the right, um, but also in the intensity, um, suggesting both that there are more mistargeted fascicles, but also that each mistargeted fascicle may contain more mistargeted axons than controls. And so these results indicate that Schwann cells play an important role to promote uh, correct axon targeting through the plexus during regeneration. And while Schwann cells are clearly doing something important during regeneration, um, I'm also working to One minute left. I'm also working to identify which specific guidance cues are expressed on Schwann cells and other cell types that actually influence axon guidance. But for the molecular part of the story, you'll have to uh, to stay tuned. So. I'm really excited about the, the potential here because uh, this model is, is um, a system where regenerating axons navigate a plexus to reform functional connections to their original muscle targets. And so the fin provides this unique opportunity to observe and manipulate axon regeneration at single axon, single synapse resolution in vivo. So I told you that Schwann cells are one cell type that play an instructive role during axon regeneration. And my long-term vision is to use the system um, as a platform to identify the guidance receptors and cues, I'm calling these the, the molecular code, um, that enable stepwise axon guidance decisions within the FIN. And I'm not only excited uh, for what the FIN can potentially reveal from a basic science perspective, um, but the goal is to take advantage of this extensive toolkit that's available in the zebrafish to understand the cellular and molecular mechanisms that enable the fish to regenerate so well, with the hope that we can translate these lessons from the fish into therapeutic applications for humans someday. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank uh, the Granada Lab, particularly my mentor, Mikhail, for the, um, the latitude and flexibility to really um, establish this project. Um, Camilo uh, and uh, Rebecca have been um, uh, really uh, uh, helpful with uh, different aspects of this, this project. Um, I'd like to thank the fish community for um, their generous sharing of, of reagents. I'm really grateful to um, these folks for their, um, their mentorship, grateful to my funding sources, and I'm particularly grateful to um, all of you and SDB, um, especially for all the support that SDB gives to trainees. I'm really grateful for, for this platform. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really cool. Really cool. Uh, so just as a reminder to everybody in the audience, like if you have any questions, just type in the Q&A box. And I see that we're always having a lot of questions in there. But first, I just have like a really naive question. Like, do they get something good from being in a plexus? Like, why do they come together first? Like, it's because like then they travel faster or something like that. Like, why would mm -hmm. they do that? What's the point of the plexus? I, I don't um, I don't really know. I mean, it's pretty common in um, in biology to have this area where um, things converge and then can resort. So it, there must it must be a center for different guidance cues, basically like a let's stop here, collect our bearings, and then move on. Perhaps um, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, thank you. So let's get to the question. So Chenbei is asking, what happens if you just tablet the Schwann cells without cutting the axons? Like, if do the wild axons degenerate, sprout into new branches, or they change their trajectory? Mm. At least in the time points that I've looked at, I think I should push it a little bit further, but they uh, they seem to be okay when they're ablated without um, injury. The axons are pretty stable where they are without the, the Schwann cells. Um, I think I've only looked in that context about 24 hours, so I should do it longer to ask. I, I like your idea too, that, that if they're helpful for maintaining kind of order or structure to those nerves. Awesome. So then the next question is by Vishnu and he wonders whether if like Schwann cells distinguish axons that go to the upper fin and to the lower fin and if so, um, so that the correct axons go to the correct area, like how they distinguish between upper and lower. Hmm. Um, I think so. So thinking about whether there is so, so there definitely are. Uh, so the Schwann cells themselves, there's about 12 of them total in the fin and um, they're kind of distributed, some of them are at the plexus, and then there's maybe three or four that are kind of throughout the front muscle and the back. Um, 
And those Schwann cells don't really move very much. They don't divide after injury. So they're kind of regional with where they are in the fin. And so uh, they're probably, um, they're probably, there's, there certainly are going to be Schwann cell axon types of interactions, but a, uh, for, especially for axons that might have to grow through different Schwann cells to get there, you know, how, how much um, direct interaction or, you know, what are those cues that are actually instructing this? I don't, I don't really know. And is one Schwann cell the same as the other or are they, do they have different molecular identities? I don't know that either. So next, Neil wants to know whether does this regenerative ability of these nerves decrease over time? Like if adults or fish can still regenerate or not? Yeah, fantastic question. Um, so uh, zebrafish are incredibly regenerative um, animals, especially you know throughout their adulthood. So folks study uh, spinal cord regeneration, tail regeneration, heart regeneration in adults. So I suspect that they will also regenerate their motor nerves. Um, one of my first uh, goals is uh, the next thing I need to do is, is establish a juvenile and, and an adult assay to ask that. Um, so I suspect that motor axons will be able to regrow. The question is, are they going to be a specific in, in their targeting in an older system? So the larval um, pectoral fin is going to be pretty stable for the next several weeks, but throughout its juvenile phase, they're actually going to get a lot more complex. So there will be more muscles added, the bone, bone will actually form, um, and the nerves will get remodeled a little bit. Um, and so you know, given the, the additional complexity at later stages, are axons going to be as, as good at targeting at that later stage? I don't know. Um, so, so that's, uh, remains to be seen. Awesome. So let's go to the next one. Uh, Dipta has a, two questions, actually. Like if you could first elaborate on potential intrinsic factors that are specific to spinal motor neurons for correct targeting. And then a second one that if you do know what happens to sensory dendrites in the pec fin due to motor axon ablation. Mm -hmm. so, um, I can start with the, the sensory uh, question first. I don't really know. Um, so this, there's our sensory axons that are in the um, the skin. Um, and so it's kind of um, like if you think of the, the, the fin like a big old sandwich, um, we have endoskeletal cells in the middle, um, nerves and glia. So there's perineural glia and Schwann cells that kind of associate with the nerves and then muscles and then skin. And within the skin, there's uh, sensory axons. Um, so they're not necessarily interacting with the motor axons unless motor axons, sometimes they will dip into the skin area. I don't know um, if there are um, interactions there. Um, and I don't think that the, the uh, sensory neurons are being affected by my injury, um, but I haven't investigated that in super detail to say for sure. Um, and then thinking about it in, uh, intrinsic factors. Um, so that's kind of the, the future goal of with this as well. So what I have done is RNA sequencing on the pectoral fin to get extrinsic cues that might be expressed within the fin after injury. Um, and the goal would be to complement this with um, sequencing those different populations of neurons as well. And that hopefully will give us neuron intrinsic guidance receptors that specify each population. And then we can hopefully match that up with uh, spatially distributed guidance cues throughout the fin and, and um, get this whole kind of holistic picture of axon targeting. That's where, that's where I want to go with this. Great question. Awesome. So next one, Shembe wants to know uh, whether Schwann cells maintain a channel that leads that regenerating axon through the previous axon track. And mm -hmm. thanks for your answer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, great question. So we know from from other contexts that that Schwann cells that form these um, bands or bungner upon which um, um, axons will regrow. And I think your question is um, um, particularly salient, thinking about the plexus region um, and, and thinking about. So clearly, Schwann cells are important, but are they? Is it a structural role that they're playing there, or a signaling role, or both? Um, and um, so I have also done so. Uh, the experiment that I showed you was ablating the Schwann cells. Um, I've also done an analogous experiment looking at SOX10 mutants, which affect the, the differentiation and development of these Schwann cells. And I see a very similar phenotype. Um, uh, but I, I don't know that that necessarily rules out structural or channel aspect versus um, versus signaling that might be coming from from these, these cells. So I think that that's a, another important avenue to investigate. Awesome. And the last question, Miklaus wants to know if you've ever seen the three different nerves clear debris and regenerate at different rates after laser ablation, or is the regeneration timeline similar between them? 
Oh, great. I, I don't know um, whether the different nerves have different um, rates. It's a little bit hard to ask that specifically because each nerve um, has a slightly different distance to grow towards its target. Um, and so thinking about um, in particular that uh, kind of middle area, the, um, so I can, I can injure the, the top nerve just fine um, and, and can look at that regrow. I can injure the bottom one and those can be kind of separated. The one that targets the middle, those axons actually have to grow through and kind of interact with, with the existing nerves. And so um, it becomes a little bit harder to distinguish that. Um, but generally speaking, anecdotally, there doesn't seem to be a huge difference between the different populations, but I haven't perhaps like single axon labeling would help um, to kind of get at that two velocities of, of growth, for example. Yeah, great question. Awesome. So just to thank you once again, Lauren, for that great talk. Yeah. It was really cool. And I think it's time for the second speaker. So Madison, whenever you have the time, just go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to introduce our second guest speaker, Dr. Shu Feng Shu. Xu Feng received his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Tsinghua University in China in 2014. He then earned his PhD from the University of Michigan in mechanical engineering in 2020, where his research focused on a variety of topics, including stem cells, neural development, microfluidics, mechanobiology, and acoustics. He is currently a postdoctoral fellow with Dr. Zinping Fu at the University of Michigan, where he developed a fully patterned synthetic human neural tube using micro fluidics-based human stem cell cultures and advanced our understanding of neural development and congenital diseases using these in vitro models. Beyond the lab, he has multiple experiences in teaching lab courses and mentoring undergraduate students focused on mechanical engineering. Um, and with that, I will let Xu Feng take over and present his exciting research. Okay. Thank you for the introduction. So, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to present my work here. So I'm going to talk about a uh, stem cells. Basically, in this project, I, I use stem cells to develop some bioengineering approaches, such as uh, microfluidics, to guide the stem cell differentiation and morphogenesis. In this way, uh, we can model or recapitulate the, recapitulate the neural tube patterning. Okay, so first, I would like to briefly introduce uh, the neural tube patterning during uh, early development. As you may all know, like, uh, in the neural tube, there are two axes. Uh, first is a rostral caudal axis. Uh, second is dorsal ventral axis. Along the rostral caudal axis, the neural tube can be divided into forebrain, midbrain, handbrain, spinal cord. And uh, then the neural progenitor cells at each region will be further specified along the orthogonal dorsal ventral axis. For example, the dorsal ventral uh, pattern of the forebrain will give rise, give rise to the formation of pallium and solid pallium in the forebrain region. And uh, the studies have uh, identified the important role of uh, morphogen gradient in regulating the neural tube patterning. For example, uh, the rostral caudal pattern of neural tube is mediated by, we know it's mediated by wind, FGF, and retinic acid. So in this project, I design some microfluid device to recapitulate the, the morphogen gradient environment of the stem cells in this way we hope to recapitulate the, both the rostral caudal patterning and dorsal ventral patterning of, of the neural tube, as well as the neural tube morphology. So to induce the proper tissue patterning, I designed this microfluid device. So there are three channels, the top channel, uh, central channel, and the bottom channel. The central channel is separated uh, from the top and bottom channel with, uh, by this uh, micro posts. And then, I can grow the human proven stem cell generated the tubular structure in the center channel. To do that, I use a micro contact printing to print the rectangular adhesive islands in the center channel. And then when I see the cells in the channel, the cells will only attach onto the adhesive islands to form a rectangular shaped uh, monolayer colony. And then one day after the cell seeding, I will load the uh, I will load 100% metro gel in the center channel to provide a 3D environment. And uh, uh, under this 3D environment, a small cavities will first emerge, and then these small cavities will fuse with each other to form an elongated central lumen, mimicking the neural tube morphology. And then, mm, and then I can I can add different chemicals into the microfluid device to induce a uh, uh, chemical gradient and the tissue patterning. For example, I can 
I can add the chemical gradient, I can add the chemical gradient along the length of the tissue or along the width of the tissue to induce a uh, tissue patterning. So first is a rostrocaudal uh, patterning in, so as I mentioned before, the rostrocaudal patterning is mediated by retinic acid, wind and FGF. So to mimic this uh, environment uh, in this microfluid device, I added uh, FGF, FGF, retinic acid and the chiron, which is a wind activator into the right reservoir of the center channel. And we have under this linear gradient, uh, proper tissue patterning will be achieved from this stem cell derived tubular structures. And uh, at the end of the assay, we can see that uh, the mark, uh, OTX2, which is a marker of the forebrain membrane, appeared on one side of the structure, uh, followed by a sequential uh, ordered expression of Hox B1, Hox B4, and Hox C9, very similar to the in vivo uh, rostrocaudal patterning profiles. And also, I also want to mention that by controlling the initial geometry and the chemical gradients, we can achieve this rostrocaudal pattern in your tube like structures in a relatively reproducible manner. So uh, the, these tissues within the same device, they share a similar tissue morphology as well as a rostrocaudal pattern uh, profiles. And I also checked another very interesting cell type is called neuromesodermal progenitor cells. As you can tell from its name, the neuromesodermal progenitor cells uh, will give rise to neural cells and also mesoderm cells uh, during the development. And uh, these neuromesodermal progenitor cells are NMPs. They are located in the most caudal part of the tissue. And it's very important for the caudal spinal cord development in this case. So I stained, the, the, our, I stained our in vitro tissues with these three markers and we identified the triple positive cells the cells that are positive for SOX2, CDX2, and uh, Bracuri, those, those cells are neuromesodermal progenitor cells. And uh, to further check the dynamics of this uh, population, I performed lab imaging using a Bracuri reporter cell. And uh, we found that Bracuri positive neuromesodermal progenitor cells mm, will for, uh, they emerge transiently, transiently in our system is consistent with the in vivo dynamics of these uh, NIT cells. Mm, next, uh, uh, next, uh, next, uh, I further studied like uh, the one important transcript factor in the NIT development, the CDX2. I further studied the role of CDX2 during the neural tube development. So the in vivo phenotype of a uh, from mouse study shows that the CDX2 is very important for the uh, caudal development. For example, it's a affects the axial elongation and the caudal spinal cord development. To study the role of CDX2 in this in vitro model, I degenerated this CDX2 knockout cells. And uh, in the control sample, we can see that in the, in the caudal part of the tissue, there is a, a lot of tissue growth, but because of the, the tissue are confined in the gels, they cannot really elongate, so they bend. But uh, if we knock out CDX2, we, uh, this tissue growth in the caudal part disappeared uh, in indicated that the CDX2 indeed play a role in the caudal spinal cord development. To specifically study how the CDX2 affect axial elongation and mix the fluorescent labeled human embryonic stem cells with the background embryonic stem cells. In this way, I can track the, the, the growth of single human proponent stem cells to check their clonal growth. And uh, at the end of the assay, the length of this colony generated from a single cell can be can indicate the the axial elongation in this process. So if if we look at the control sample for, first, so in the most caudal region, the colony length is significantly larger than other regions, indicating the uh, indicating in our in vitro neural tube tissue the caudal part elongate uh, elongate. Uh, uh, at a higher rate than the, the other regions. But if we knock out CDX2, this uh, axial elongation is significantly uh, inhibited, indicating the CDX2 uh, in our system is indeed is also very important for the axial elongation. And also, I also checked the rostral caudal patterning, uh, whether the CDX2 will affect the rostral caudal patterning. So in the control group, we have uh, this spatially organized uh, expression, Hox B1, Hox B4, and Hox C9. But if we in, uh, knock out CDX2, the 
Hox B1, Hox B4 expression was not affected, but Hox C9 expression was completely gone, indicating that indeed Hox CXCDX2 is very important for the caudal spinal cord development and uh, axial elongation. Uh, in the previous slides, I have shown that we can generate a rostral caudal pattern in your tube like structures. And here I want to show that on using the same microfluid device, we can achieve both rostral caudal and dorsal ventral pattern neural tube like structures. To do that, we add another additional step to add chemical gradients in perpendicular to the tissue to induce a dorsal ventral patterning. This video showed the, gro the tissue growth during the second step. As you can see that during the, rostral, during the dorsal ventral pattern, you can see some cells, some single cells start to delaminate from the top part of the tissue, and these cells are neocrest cells. I will talk about these cells uh, more in the later part of this presentation. And uh, first, uh, under this protocol, first the rostral caudal patterning was uh, still achieved. Mm, as you can see, the uh, spatially organized expression of OTX2, HOXP1, HOXP4, and HOXC9. And uh, another interesting observation is that OTX2 positive forebrain midbrain like region are significantly wider than other regions, uh, suggesting a rapid tissue growth in the lateral direction in the rostral region. Mm. In terms of a dorsal ventral patterning, we can see that in this tissue, the PAC7 positive dorsal neuroprogenic cells appeared on the top, but the oligo 2 positive like a motor neuron uh, progenitor cells. Uh, emerged in the bottom, indicating, indicating a rudimentary dorsal ventral patterning. And, the, and then I performed uh, tissue sectionings to reveal the cross section of the tissue at different regions to further visualize their dorsal ventral patterning. And before that, let's first uh, take a look at the in vivo image. So during the in vivo development, the dorsal ventral patterning of forebrain will give TVRATS to TVRATS2 pallium in the dorsal side, which is positive for PAC6 and some. Uh, some pallium, which are positive for mm, DLX2 and NKS2.1. And similarly, in the rotary region of our tissue, the cross section showed a spatially organized expression of PAC6 on the top and the DLX2 and NKS2.1 in the bottom, very similar to the dorsal ventral patterning of the uh, forebrain region. And uh, in the spinal cord region, we also achieved the spatially organized expression of FOX A2. A NCAX 2.2 and oligo 2, similar to the dorsal ventral patterning of the spinal cord region. So uh, I have talked about that our uh, the, the microfluidic neurotubulic -like, -like structures can recapitulate the, both the rostral caudal and dorsal ventral patterning. And here is a, we also studied the, the neural crest development. Neural crest is a very interesting cell type. During the development, they will delaminate from the uh, top part of the tissue and migrate away as single cells to their destination. And these neural crest cells, they can differentiate and develop into a variety of tissues, such as the uh, mesenchymal cells in our craniofacial regions and the heart, or the peripheral nervous system, such as the Schwann cells and the sensory neurons. One, in, one very interesting observation is that the neural crest cells at different axial lo locations actually de uh, develop differently. For example, the, the mesenchymal cells can only be developed from the cranial neural crest cells in the rostral region, but the sympathetic neurons can only be de uh, developed from the, the caudal neural crest or trunk neural crest cells at the caudal region. So, um, and it turns out that our in vitro system can also recapitulate this uh, axial position dependent neural crest cell development. For example, the twist one positive mesenchymal cells can only be observed in the rostral region of our structure, but the Fox 2B positive sympathetic neurons can only uh, are, is only evident in the most caudal part of our tissue, indicating a uh, in our in vitro uh, neural tube model we can also achieve this axial position dependent neural crest cell development. So the, the we uh, we also perform the single cell sequencing to and to characterize our this uh, neural tube like structures at mm, at single cell level and you can see the, the unbiased the clustering analysis revealed many neural tube regions for example forebrain midbrain handbrain spinal cord and also 
uh, from day four to day nine to day, day 21, we can clearly see a cell trans cell phase transition from the neuron progenitor cells to the neurons, indicating a continued development during this in vitro assay. And uh, we also compared our in vitro data with the mouse embryo data at uh, early, at a, at a um, late gastrulation, the early organogenesis stage, as this PCA analysis revealed a similarity of our day four data with the uh, mouse E8.25 data and our day nine, day 21 data, very similar to mouse E10.5, 11.5 data. So if we integrate our in vitro and in vivo data together, you can clearly see that the, uh, the in vitro data, the overlaps with the in vivo data relatively well, indicating a similar transcranetomic profiles. So if we zoom in to compare cell type composition, and let's use a day nine data as an example, you can see the two data sites in vitro and in vivo, they um, have a similar cell type composition and each class, each cell type overlaps with their in vivo counterpart relatively well, indi further indicating a similar transcriptomic uh, profiles. So uh, I think, I hope uh, right now, I uh, hope I have presented that um, we have our neural tube, our microfluidic neural tube uh, like structures can recapitulate both uh, retrocaudal dorsal ventral patterning as well as a neural crest development. And next question is that, can we use it to study some diseases, study some disease mechanisms? So here I'm going to give you one example to use this in vitro model to study a congenital disease called CHARGE syndrome. CHARGE syndrome is a congenital disease that mainly affects the cranial facial regions and, and also heart development. Mm. And it turns out that most of the CHARGE syndrome most of the charge syndrome is caused by a mutation in single genes called uh, CHD7. CHD7 is a chromatin remodeler and affects many transcription factors and signaling pathways. Mm. Another interesting uh, another interesting finding of the charge syndrome is that many charge syndrome affected the tissues. Uh, such as the craniofacial tissues or the heart actually are derived from neural crest cells. And indeed, in vivo studies show that if the CH7 knockdown will affect the neural crest migration in the Xenopus embryos. So because in our model, we also, we have a, we have a, a special pattern of neural progenitor cells and the emergence of neural crest cells, which provide a suitable system to study the charge syndrome. And we collaborated with uh, Dr. Donna Martin in the medical school in Yerevan. Uh, her lab generated this, uh, mm, generated this induced proton stem cells from charged patients. And also they used CRISPR-Cas9 to correct the mutation to generate this uh, isogenic control cell lines. When we uh, derive the neural tube-like structures from these cell lines, from both uh, control uh, induced proton stem cells and charged patient derived IPS cells. Uh, here is an image showed the morphology of neural crest cells. And we can clearly see the morphology difference between the control and the charged patient derived induced proton stem cells. So in the control cells, the neural crest cells are more dispersed, dispersed and uh, migratory. But in the charged patient derived IPS cells, the neural crest cells is not as migratory as the control cells. Mm. And also, uh, we know that uh, epithelial to mesenchymal transition is very important for the neural crest cell migration. So after the, when we stain the cell, when we stain the cells with twist one, which is a marker for the uh, EMT process, we found that the twist one positive cells is significantly decreased in the charged patients. The data here show that indeed there is a, mm, there is a, Defective neural crest migration in the charge patient derived samples consistent with the uh, uh, in vivo studies and the charge patient uh, phenotype. And another, we, uh, and also it turns out charge, charge, charge syndrome does not only affect the cranial facial tissues, it's also a neural developmental disorders and affect the neuron development. So its image showed that the cerebellum defects in these charge patients. Mm. Because in our system, we can achieve the retrocaudal pattern, uh, neural tube regions, and we want to ask whether the charge 
syndrome will affect the rostral caudal patterning at early uh, stage of neural development. When we send the samples with OTX2, which is a marker for the forebrain membrane, we can see that the OTX2 positive forebrain membrane like regions decreased in the charge, charge samples. Indeed, that we found that a charge syndrome can affect the forebrain membrane development at the early stage. Mm. At last, we studied the, we studied the molecular mechanism understanding uh, underlying this uh, forebrain membrane uh, defects. So to do that, we performed a multi-omic uh, analysis. We generated these uh, uh, neural tube like structures from both control and the charge IPS cells, and we performed single cell RNA sequencing to examine the uh, gene expression, also the single cell ATAC sequencing to examine the chromatin accessibility. Uh, here, this is a um, single cell RNA sequencing data of the integrated data sets. Uh, as you can see that the, the ratio of forebrain membrane cluster is decreased when we compare the charge and the control patient, control samples are consistent with the immunostaining data I showed in the last slides. One minute so, left. Thank you. And we also performed this uh, Mm, uh, to study how the SHD7 in the charge sample affects the forebrain membrane development, uh, we analyzed this uh, uh, single cell ATAC data. We found that mm, in the charge patients, the accessibility of OTX2 promoter region and one membrane specific enhancer region decreased compared to the control data. And also, we uh, performed this uh, co-accessibility analysis. As you can see that in the control data, there is a line connecting these two membrane-specific enhancers, indicating the enhancer-enhancer interaction. But uh, in the charge um, sample, the, the, this two, these interactions between the two membrane-specific uh, membrane enhancers disappeared. So we found that the CHD7 indeed affects the promoter and one specific one membrane specific enhancer accessibility and also affect, uh, affects enhancer to enhancer interactions, which uh, potentially under which potentially explains the um, forebrain membrane development defects in the charge patients. So at last, I would like to uh, thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Jian Fu. And uh, we are engineers, so we are good at uh, developing these in vitro systems. So, and also we collaborate with a lot of uh, uh, biologists uh, in neural development to bring organoid and uh, especially the, the charge patient, especially the charge syndrome studies. So to use, to, to see how we can use this in vitro model to study fundamental human questions. Without that, I would like to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, while we wait for questions to be entered, I'll go ahead and just get us started. Um, so I saw you showed kind of more earlier development, but with your model system, how far in development are you able to achieve um, in neurodevelopment? Can you get like, if you like, how far can you mimic, like say in mice, are you able to get kind of that later development of the neural tube or does it stay around like 10.5, 11.5? Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, a very good question. Actually, we are working on that. One, we are working at, uh, we are working on that. We are trying to um, prolong the culture to to use the the culture protocol derived from like a brain organoid to see if the the those dorsal ventral pattern neural progenitor cells in our in our system can indeed give rise to like a GABAergic neurons and uh, glutamatergic neurons in, in an organized way and see how these neurons will interact to form the neural circles. Yes, that's definitely one of the directions, if a very important direction we are working on right now. And is the is the timeline a lot quicker versus, I guess it's like human iPS cells. So what's the timeline of your, of your process versus normal development? Mm, you mean for the neurons to appear or? Yeah, like for, you know, for your stages of your caudal and rostral axis, as well as for your, you know, different neurons to appear, is it a lot quicker than you would see in normal development? I think uh, if we compare the, the uh, this in vitro, the timeline of this in vitro model with human development, it's much faster because you see, I think the neural patterning, the neural tube formation, the patterning of a human neural tube is, is around one month. But here, the rostral caudal patterning is, uh, is uh, most of data is, uh, is from nine days or like uh, 
20 days. So it's indeed in the in vitro system, it's much higher, much faster. I think that's probably because we, we add those, uh, the environment is very pro-neuron development. We add those chemicals to really to push the stem cell differentiate into uh, neuron progenitor cells. And we didn't really go through some like early stage, like a uh, gastrulation in this mm -hmm. in vitro model. Okay, we have a question from Marsha. She wants to know, is your charged patient studies, or in your charged patient studies, is your control derived from the corrected patient cells? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay. And then um, Chinbei would like to know, can you move the positions of the domains of different brain regions if you change the steepness of the gradient? Yes, yes, yes. We have a study that we can change the we can change the duration uh, of the gradient and we can change the stiffness of the gradient by adding like a higher concentration of chemicals in one reservoir and the, the, the regions, the region position will be changed. Yeah, we can control that actually. Okay. Right, we have something from Ruth who says, great talk, um, an awesome system. She wants to know, um, there are numerous mutations in CHT7 that have been reported in charge. What type of mutation was present in your patient? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I I don't know this question actually. So I need to go back to our collaborator to really to ask the details. Sorry about that. It, yeah. Zeke asks, there seem to be a few ectopic rosettes in the tube wall in cross-section. Do you, these become more or less prevalent over time? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we, we indeed, uh, there is a major lumen, uh, uh, big lumen in the center and there is a few small rosettes surrounding the major lumens. It's, a, it's quite consistent observation. And the, as the time goes, the time goes, it will become like a more prevalent, like a, the, the rosette number will become uh, higher and higher. And, uh, the, and also the, the large central lumen will, will not be maintained during the long-term development. And I saw with your neural tube, um, you had neural crest cells almost migrating out. Are they able to fully migrate out um, as you would see in normal development or you know, are they missing key factors that you would see in the environment? I, I wouldn't see the, yeah, I think they will miss a lot of factors as, a, as in vivo and also it's a migration behavior actually, is actually different from in vivo. You know, during the in vivo, the neural crest cells actually migrate to a ventral side, but in our, it's, 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 I would say the migration environment of the neural crest cells is quite, quite artificial. We didn't really characterize like a, a different type of neural crest cells will migrate differently. It's a very interesting question. I did, we didn't really study that. And we have a question from Ruth again. Um, she wants to know how was the regulatory landscape affected? Were certain cell types particularly affected? Um, NCC from all axial levels are disrupted and charged. Were some more perturbed than others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, also in in the data I showed here, neuron crest cells, uh, the data are all from cranial neuron crest cells in most of the cranial region. And we also studied the if the the char syndrome will affect like the trunk neuron crest development. So in terms of the migra ma migration, the, they didn't char syndrome didn't affect the trunk neuron crest cell development. It's it's very interesting. So only the cranial neuron crest cell become less migratory when we compare the charged patient charge samples with the control samples. But in the trunk region, they actually behave similarly. It's actually it's also consistent with the disease phenotype, right? Because the charge syndrome mainly affects the cranial facial regions and not as much, not, not like a much of the trunk regions actually. Okay. Um, and I just have like one final question. So, so I look at the neural tube in mice um, and we look at more kind of regionalized areas in the, in the neural tube, specifically the dorsal neural tube. Are you able to see these like very regionalized areas? Because I saw yours is more kind of broad overview of the neural tube. Are you able to kind of visualize these um, smaller regions or more specific transcription factors that you would see? Uh, yeah, you're talking about the dorsal ventral patterning, if we can see those like a uh, very sharp yeah. boundaries between different, yeah, right now, so we I have another work that we can achieve uh, boundaries between the ventral domains, but now, now in this one, we are still working on to improve the protocol to really to achieve uh, uh, very sharp boundaries between each progenitor regions. Yeah, right now it's, it's not achieved yet. Awesome. Well, we are now at the end of our session. So I just want to go ahead and thank Lauren and Shufeng again um, for your excellent talks. And thank you everyone for asking your questions.
Um, this seminar has been recorded and is is like will be available on the SDB website next week. So look out for that. Um, and also join us for our next month's seminar on Friday 14th, where Lewis Prawl from the University of Pennsylvania and Harini Ramalingam from the UT Southwestern Medical Center will present. So thank you everyone for coming and have a great rest of your day.